So yeah, we'll be talking about efficiency, equity, trade-offs, and the Irish carbon tax. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to introduce you a bit to the Irish climate policy world and to the matter we use, which is CG model, or general equilibrium model. So you're going to have to wait for the fun stuff. Oh, this doesn't work. There we go. So Irish climate policy. So as you might might not know, Ireland is part of the European Union. Uh, I hope you all knew that. And um, the European Union has acted as one in terms of the Paris Agreement. So they um, submitted their national determined contributions as a whole to the EU. Um, so all European climate policies are driven by these EU targets. And these EU targets are a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030, relative to 1990, and climate neutrality by 2050. And these targets were also translated into European law, the European climate law, which basically makes them legally binding. And um, the EU has two main targets to reduce emissions to reach these targets, uh, two main policies. Uh, the first is the emissions trading scheme, the ETS. And the second is the effort sharing regulation, the ES. All right. So I'll talk about each of these in turn. So the EU ETS um, was introduced in 2005. Basically, it's a cap and trade system. So the idea is that if you want to admit any greenhouse gases or basically CO2, you have to have an allowance to do that. You have to submit an allowance for it to include or admit greenhouse gases. And then they cap the amount of allowances that are there and people can trade allowances. So the reason they use that is because by doing this, you allow firms to reduce emissions where it's cheapest to do so within the European Union. So the EU ETS covers about 45% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe or in the EU. And it's, it started in 2005 and then it has different phases that we're going through. So I'll talk a bit about the history of this. So phase one was between 2005 and 2007. It included the EU 27 countries and there was no cap. So they just looked at what people were polluting, made the same amount of allowances and gave it back to the people who were polluting. So it was more of an administrative tryout, we could say. Allowances were free. It covered very like emission intensive sectors like power and heat, oil refineries, cement, fill carbons, et cetera. And basically, what happened in this phase is that there was an oversupply of allowances, which just kind of crashed the whole market and the price fell to zero. So I'll show you a price graph later where you can see that happen. Then the second phase was introduced between 2008 and 2012. Uh, Norway, Ireland, and Liechtenstein joined. God knows why, given how unsuccessful the first phase was, but okay. Uh, again, there was no reduction path, so there was no cap in emissions. And the allowances were mainly free, like 90% were free. And the aviation sector was added in 2012. So in 2008, you know, we had the financial great financial crisis, which again reduces production in an economy, reduces emission demand, emission allowance of demand, which again led to a very low price. Then came phase three. In 2013 to 2020, Croatia joined in this, and finally they introduced a cap. So they decided to reduce emission by about 1.7 percent per year. And the allowances were originally given out for free, but then over time these were reduced and auctioned off. Um, the rest I'm not going to go through, but the important thing is that other sectors were introduced as well. So it was not only these highly pollutant sectors, but also just Basically, if your firm is big, you also include it. Like Amazon in Ireland is included, Google, like the big companies that would use a lot of energy are also included. And they introduced market mechanisms. So they realized that, okay, we're hitting this zero carbon price, it's not working. We need to have some control of the market. So they introduced what's called the NSR, which is the Market Stability Reserve. That means that they keep some of the allowances to be able to help control the market. But um, now we're in phase four, which is from 2021 to 2030. 
uh, the United Kingdom has sadly left the EU, so they left. Um, the annual cap has been, the, the, the cap reduction has been increased to 2.2% decrease per year. And the MSR intake has increased from 12 to 24% of total allowances are being held by the EU to control markets. Um, and now, since then, we, we kind of ramped up our ambition. So as I said before, our carb our emissions reduction um, target for 2030 is 55% reduction. So we've introduced um, a lot of policies and changes to the ETS based on this fit for 55 policy package. Um, the main one is that the reduction factor in the cap has gone from, it's almost doubled from 2.2% to 4.2%. So the amount of allowance is, is decreased by 4.2% every year. And a lot of the free allowances have been taken away. So they're phasing out free allowances. So for example, from 2026, there'll be no free allowances in aviation. Um, they also, they haven't done this yet, but in 2024, they want to do maritime transport, so shipping. And they also want to introduce a new emissions trading scheme to look at building and transport emissions, but that's still in the negotiation phase. So this is a kind of the journey of the EU ETS allowance price. Started in 2005, phase one was around about 20 euro, went nicely up to 30. And then the verified emissions data was leaked and everybody saw that, okay, the emissions are much less than we thought they would be, that we have many allowances and the price plummeted to zero. Then in 2008, we started again with around 20, things started going up, went well. Economic crisis happened, and the price went down to around 15 euro. Then in phase three, it actually reduced even more, um, but it was around eight, nine euro for a very long time between 2012 and 2017. In 2017, the negotiation started for this tighter uh, emission reduction target, and the price started to go up because you can you can trade emissions through the different phases. So people were like, okay, the mission price is gonna go up, we're gonna buy some while we can. And then you got the Green Deal proposal and the Fit for 55 package, which just ramped up the price. And we now have phase four, the price is around 90 euro uh, per ton. So you see that, um, yeah, it was very low for a very long time and now it's gone up. And in the last year, because of the UK crisis, the price has been crazy. It fluctuates basically on a daily basis. So that was the ETS. The other mechanism that the EU has to, to reduce emissions is called the effort sharing um, regulation. So basically what the EU does is says, okay, for emissions that don't fall under the ETS, we're gonna set legally binding national targets for the member states, and they must use national policies to reduce those emissions. So the EU basically just tells countries to reduce their non-ETS emissions. So these emissions um, come from three main sources. The first is agriculture, the second is transport, and the final is residential heating. And the EU, the island's non-ETS target is a 42% reduction by 2030. So that's the EU level target. However, Ireland has come come out to say that they want to be a climate leader, so they've introduced um, more stringent targets. So in 2020, the plan for government included an annual emission reduction of 7%, which would mean a 51% reduction by 2030. And this was, again, made legally binding in the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act, and further commits to uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So Ireland has set basically very stringent targets for itself. So what do Irish emissions look like? This is in 2021, where the emissions are coming from. The largest by far source of our emissions is agriculture with 37.5%. Uh, then you get transportation. So you can see both of these are non-ETS sectors. And then you get the energy industries, residential heating, um, which is again non-ETS and manufacturing combustion, which can be ETS and non-ETS. Then you have waste, um, air taxes, and other commercial public services, etc. So most of our um, emissions are coming from agriculture, 
and then the usual suspects of transportation and energy use. So if you look at ETS versus non-ETS, this is our ETS share, which is basically around 20% of our total emissions. So we have a unique case where we have a very low level of ETS emissions in our total emissions profile and a very high non-ETS profile. So what are we doing to reduce these emissions? Well, we're not doing much to reduce agricultural emissions. So we're just gonna ignore that for now. Um, but concerning the other uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we've been implemented a carbon tax. That's one of the main policy tools we have in a kind of a price perspective. We have other policies such as subsidies for retrofitting and EVs, but our main basically taxation tool is this carbon tax. It applies to all fossil fuels except kerosene for aviation. So again, the EU complicates things because the EU has something called the European uh, no, the Energy Tax Directive, which basically tells EU countries they're not allowed to tax kerosene used for aviation. So we, like our hands are tied in certain senses at the EU level. However, they are changing. So, that's good. so ETS emissions are exempt from this carbon taxation. So your emissions either fall under the ETS or under the non-ETS carbon taxation. So this is the, the price trajectory of the Irish carbon tax. It started in about 2012, went up to 20 euro, and then it kind of plateaued and stayed at 20 euro for a very long time. And then in 2018, I moved to Ireland and started working on this issue to develop the I3 model, and then you can see a sharp increase in the trajectory of the carbon tax. Hmm? I know, it's just amazing. Um, so, the good thing about the Irish carbon tax is it's committed to a trajectory of an increase in carbon tax up to 25. So that's basically given. Um, so it sends a very clear message to, to people concerning the carbon tax. So how are we doing? Well, this graph shows the historical emissions to 2022, and then it shows the emissions projections. The yellow line is our existing policy scenario. So that's with the existing measures in place. And then we have a blue line, which is additional measures. This includes the measures that the government says they will implement, but haven't implemented yet. And then you have this gray line, which is the 7% yearly reduction that we've made legally binding. You can see, um, we're not doing great. So just a summary of this, basically what, what you need to learn from this is that the Irish emissions are either taxed by the carbon tax or fall under the EU ETS um, system. So now we're gonna carry on to uh, my short introduction to computable general equilibrium modeling. Has anybody heard of computable general equilibrium modeling? Yeah? Okay, I hope not too much. <laughs> So uh, CG modeling, um, it's also called applied general equilibrium modeling, so age modeling. That would sound strange to me. Um, so what CG models do is they put economic data to a set of equations which aims to capture the structure of the economy and the behavioral response of agents. So if CG modeling had a slogan, it would be market and equilibrium. So that's the main thing that they do. So the idea is that in a CG model, you represent many different markets and all of them must be in equilibrium. So for example, for a different production sector, say the agricultural sector, what the agricultural sector supplies in terms of goods must equal how much is demanded from the rest of the economy. And this must hold for all production sectors. What a household consumes must be equal to their income and minus their savings. So all of these markets need to be in equilibrium. The label demand must equal the label supplied, et cetera, et cetera. So when these markets are in equilibrium, that determines the different prices in the economy, right? So it's basically a, a simultaneous constraint optimization for multiple agents, where an agent is a production sector, household, and government. So these different optimization, um, optimizations of agents will determine the relative prices in the economy. So the prices are endogenously determined by these markets and they drive the behavioral change in the model. 
So as prices change, production sectors will switch to cheaper inputs and households will change their consumption bundles based on prices as well. So if the price of, I don't know, apples goes up, they'll switch to other food instead. So concerning the time dimension of CG modeling, you have basically three main types. You have a static CG model that's the most popular because it's obviously the easiest to make. Um, so in a static CG model, basically you have, you replicate the current economy, you have a policy shock, and then you see what the new equilibrium will look like. Uh, then you have a recursive dynamic. So a recursive dynamic model is, it has a time dimension to it, but the decisions are still made in each period. So in each period, a decision is made, and then you go to the next period, and then you make the decision, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have an intertemporal um, CG model, which is forward-looking. So all of the agents can see into the future and optimize their consumption and investment paths over time. So the CG models are, are calibrated based on supply and use tables. So these are readily available in almost all countries. Um, and we show how inputs and outputs flow between production sectors in the economy. These are then supplemented by other data concerning income and government expenditure, et cetera, to get a social accounting matrix. And um, then elasticities are determined to, to kind of represent the switching behavior. So elasticity of substitution will show how much you can substitute one good for another good in your production process, or you can substitute one good for another good in your consumption bundle as a consumer. So the, the main point of CG modeling is that you can explicitly model the sectoral interlinkages. And, and that helps you understand the wider economic impacts through different transmission uh, mechanisms in the economy. So the idea is, okay, if you start taxing diesel, that'll increase the price of diesel, which will also increase the production costs in agriculture, which will increase the price of agricultural products, which will increase the production costs of the food sector, which will, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it follows, it flows through the whole economy. And it's very important to understand these wider implications, specifically when you're talking about energy policies, because everybody uses energy. And it has these, these micro behavioral responses. So it can see, you know, what how people will react to these prices and how that will further impact the economy. So now I'm gonna talk about our CG model, which is the I3 model, the island environment, energy, and economy model. We have a website for the interested person. So we have a dynamic, so an intertemporal CG model. Um, it has 37 production, and actually now it's 39 production sectors. Um, so these are kind of like representative firms uh, producing different goods. We have uh, 42 different commodities, and we explicitly include carbon commodities. So we'll have diesel kerosene as an actual commodity in the model. And uh, we look at emissions from combustions, dividing these between ETS and non-ETS emissions. And as a detailed government sector, so you can you can really focus on, for example, you can increase the, the value added tax in the accommodation sector, or you can increase the transfers to households. Um, Okay. You can look at detailed policies. We also include uh, 10 different representative households. So to be able to understand the, the equality impacts of, of different policies, we include different types of households. We have five rural households and five urban households. This whole urban rural divide is very important in Irish policy. There's a lot of talk about it. What we find is that it doesn't make too much difference, but it's, it's very um, heated debate. So we include um, urban households and rural households, and then we divide the, them in terms of an income. So we basically have rich to poor, urban, rich to poor, um, rural. We have three different types of labor, low, medium, and high skilled labor. So we have different agents in the model. Uh, the first is households. So what households do is they maximize the utility through consumption demand, right? And they provide labor and capital, which is used by production sectors to produce goods. And they uh, obviously receive 
money for delivering this labor and capital. Mm -hmm. And they also receive um, transfers from the government, so social benefits, pensions, and unemployment benefits. Then you have production sectors which maximize their dividends through production, and they consume labor and capital. And you have the government which receives taxes, um, many different taxes, so value added taxes, production taxes, corporate taxes, carbon taxes, wage taxes, etc. And it also transfers to households and production sectors. And then you have a rest of the world account that um, looks at the imports and exports of to and from Ireland. So this is kind of a representation of the agents and how they interact in the model. So this is really the, the main point of the CG model is that you have all of these agents interacting with each other simultaneously. So if you start a household, you see that households um, supply labor and capital to the factor market, and they receive dividends and wages for supplying that. They demand goods from the product market. Um, they pay taxes to the, to the government and receive charges on the government. And then on the other side, firms demand labor and capital from the factors market. They pay for this, they pay taxes to the government, receive transfers from the government, and they demand goods from the product market as intermediate inputs and also investments. And then the government gets taxes, pays transfers, and also demands goods from the product market. And then you have the rest of the world, which we have inputs and exports into the product market. So all of these things are happening simultaneously um, to create an equilibrium. So I'm going to go in a little bit more detail about these different agents. So as I said before, we have 10 different households. We have um, representative household groups. So basically, you have, it looks like there's five up to 10 households in the model, but these are representative of a group of households that are similar in terms of rural or urban and their income. And it's based on their disposable income. And their disposable income in the model is their net of tax wage, the dividend income, so basically what they get from capital and labor, and then the welfare transfers from the government, pensions from the government, and a foreign asset holding, and then non-means tested transfers. So these basically only came into play with COVID and the Ukraine crisis where the government was just giving each household 300 euro or whatever it was. And then, what households do is they did, firstly, they determine their level of com composite consumption. So they say, okay, how much am I going to consume and how much am I going to save? And then based on how much they choose to consume, they decide what they consume themselves. I mean, it's not that they literally first decide that, but this is how it is model technically. And the households are calibrated based on household budget survey and the SILF, which is the living something survey. Um, so basically, each household has a unique, each household group has a unique consumption bundle based on data of the household surveys. They also have a, a unique uh, labor income. So each household is linked to specific sh a share of different labor types and also uh, different consumption commodities. And the same with capital, right? So, for example, you see that low income households have less capital holdings, and low income households will generally have more low skilled labor than high skilled labor, et cetera, et cetera. So, we try and define these households in terms of what they spend and what they get. So, this is how the composite consumption nested structure looks. So, as I said before, the household chooses how much it's going to consume in terms of composite consumption. And then this is divided into different nests, nests of consumption. So the first is transportation, which is land, water, and air transportation. And then the land transportation is divided into private transportation and non-private transportation. And then private transportation can be um, delivered using electricity, diesel, or um, petrol. Then you have residential energy, which is either supplied by electricity or um, by natural gas, solid fuels and liquid fuels. Then you have uh, nutrition. So basically the idea here is that 
as poor as you are, you probably or as expensive as food gets, you're not going to substitute it away completely. You always have to eat. So the substitution possibilities with this is less. And then you have services and other consumption. So basically through this next structure, if prices, for example, increase in, I don't know, education services, you will consume less of that and switch to other services instead. That's the idea um, of how the consumption is changes based on the ch changes in prices due to a poverty shock. So if you look at production, we have 39 sectors. So these are kind of representative firms. So a sector would produce a specific good, like agriculture, transportation, trade, chemicals, good one in Ireland, um, and pharmaceuticals. So the idea is that in the model, the often in CG model, what happens is that the firm maximizes its production or minimizes its cost based on a level of production. But in our model, um, we have a dynamic investment decision where the firm maximizes its dividends payoff. Right? So that's more representative of the real world. Um, so we have three different types of firms. So basically, what we want to understand is mostly the energy demand. So we divide firms into different kinds of groups depending on how they use energy. So for example, agriculture uses diesel. It can't switch really a lot. I mean, tractors use diesel. That's just how the world is at the moment. So they have less substitution possibilities. Whereas other firms that mainly use um, energy for business, heating have more switching possibilities. So it kind of depends on the industry, how their nested structure looks and what their substitution possibilities are. We have 49 commodities and 11 of these are energy commodities are a coal, peat, crude oil, gasoline, LPG, fuel oil, diesel, kerosene, natural gas, other petroleum products, and electricity. So this is a very important part of the model. By explicitly including these carbon commodities, we can see how they, where they're used in the economy and how the emissions basically flow, flow through the production process. Do you have like uh, post coming energy commodities? Yeah, we, we don't at the moment, but we that's what we're busy including at the moment. So we busy including um, biomass, hydrogen. We do have renewables. Um, so we have solar, um, wind. But yeah, we're busy including those at the moment. It's just very hard because the, the idea of a CG model is to replicate the economy and show how things flow from different sectors. So if you it's very hard to introduce something that's not here yet. You shouldn't actually do it, but you need to when you're talking about energy. So you have to kind of make assumptions and uh, include it. So this is just an example of the sectors. I don't think anybody wants to go into them too much, too much detail. So this is how a general um, production structure looks in the model. Uh, production is determined by value added, which is capital and labor, the three different labor types. And then you have business energy, which is basically fuel, electricity, and business heating. So the fuel you can substitute between these different fuels. Business heating can be delivered by different fuels and electricity. And then you have the other inputs. Electricity production is slightly different because they don't use business heating, but it's, it's the same kind of principle. You can use different ways of producing electricity. What do you say, like all these the other sectors, right? Which one? All other inputs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other inputs means the inputs coming from the other sectors? Yeah, so for like example, or... yeah, so it would be like transport services or admin services in the case of electricity or machinery repairs, etc. Does the material come? Uh, what kind of material? Uh, for the like, material used for the material. Yeah, but what material? Like, water. 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 Yeah, no. So that's why I was asking you what material is very much the next. So basically, the inputs are based on the commodity by the production side. So, for example, we would have a waste commodity produced by the production sector, but it's not income of waste. It's just 
waste in the monetary terms. Um, so the carbon, the only thing that we actually have in a kind of material term, the carbon commodities, which are linked to emissions. So that sounds like, uh, like, I don't know, like we're making a turbine in some kind of material, doesn't matter we are accounted for, for the purpose of like circular economy. No, no, it's, it's not, it, it, we don't look at like, Terms of cement and where that goes to, or things like that. It's relative, it would be relatively easy to do. Um, so, we do, as I say, our, our model focuses on carbon and emissions. So, we do have, for example, emission accounting, or like in agriculture, we have the amount of sheep and the amount of cows. So, we only count things in, let's say, real terms when it comes to carbon, but not when it comes to like. Materials, waste, etc. That is uh, something that we could think about in the future. It wouldn't be too difficult to do, but it can sit uh, on the if it counts very very good that sit here, like it would be, it would the be others. So it depends. Like so, if you're talking about water or land, that would be um, part of it. Would be uh, a production factor, right? If you're talking about waste. Or it would be a residue less cement, it would probably be so it just it really depends on, on what you're talking about. But I think certain things really need to be a factor of production, such as land and water, whereas other things such as cement, I wouldn't call that a factor of production, it's just an input. So it would be an input with an additional material flow, I would suggest. Okay, so as I said before, we all know now all about the ETS and non-ETS. So in the model, we distinguish between both of these. So for some production sectors, their emissions fall completely under the ETS, such as electricity generation or aviation. But for most sectors, a share of their emissions will fall under the ETS and a share will fall under the carbon tax. And the reason for this is because big firms in a production sector would fall under the ETS, where small wouldn't. So it's just a, a mixed bag of where your emissions fall. So the real unit cost of carbon is basically, or the carbon commodity, is the purchase price, which is common to all agents and includes all taxes, including the carbon tax. And then you would adjust this by um, adding the net cost of the EU ETS and then reducing it by the carbon tax exemption. So basically in the model, each sector pays a different um, cost for their fossil fuel inputs. Then we have our factors of production. We have um, sector specific capital. We just have one form of capital. And then we have low, medium, and high skilled labor. So our labor market is quite detailed because Ireland has a quite unique labor market. Um, we have involuntary unemployment. So we have equilibrium wage rates uh, that are determined by wage equations. And we have international migration. So migration plays a very important role in the Irish labor market. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of migration, half of which is coming from the high skilled labor force. Um, but yeah, the, the Irish labor market is very, you have the, 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 pop, the supply coming from population, but then you have this additional supply coming from migration, which is really large. Um, and then we have an endogenous allocation of total labor supply across sectors based on the wage income maximization problem. So basically the way it's it's like a labor market, the different production sectors compete to demand the labor by by upping the wage price. Right. Then we have the government. So the government um, has income which is uh, direct taxes, indirect taxes, production tax. And it also gets half of the ETS price at the moment. I don't know what's going to happen next year, but at the moment they get half of the ETS. And then they spend money, obviously, on consumption, transfers to household, and interest payments. Um, in our model, the government's policies are set without an objective function. So basically, we just determine that you know how much they consume increases with um, the price level and how much uh, the total transfer to household is depends on CPI and also on the unemployment rate. 
and the government can borrow from abroad, but the savings to GDP ratio um, determines the risk premium. So basically, the more that they borrow from the board abroad, the higher the interest rate. So getting back to our research question after this introduction to CG modeling and Irish common policies. Um, carbon taxation is a very important tool, uh, a tool, policy tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, it has negative impacts on the, it's generally found to have negative impacts on the economy. It's also found to be regressive. So the idea is that if you look at different households, it's, it impacts poorer households more negatively than it impacts, impacts richer households. Um, so obviously that's not good news. However, what we also see from the literature is that carbon tax revenues can be used to reduce these bad economic impacts and these bad equity impacts. So what this paper does is investigate whether we can achieve a triple dividend. So triple dividend means that we reduce our emissions, we have economic growth, and we have improved equity. So it's kind of the holy trinity of policy. Can we find this for Ireland? So we use the I3 model to do this. So if we look at the previous literature, there's been hundreds of CG papers on this topic. And the general conclusion is firstly that carbon taxation reduces emissions. Everybody kind of agrees on that. The second um, conclusion is that carbon taxation is bad for the economy. Again, everybody agrees on that. However, when it comes to the, the equity results, there's not much agreement. So the first conclusion is, is that Carbon taxation can be both regressive and progressive. It depends on who's looking at it. They find sometimes it's regressive, sometimes it's progressive. And finally, what we also see in the literature is that revenue recycling has impacts. So I'm going to talk a bit about this, um, this equality impact of carbon taxation because I find it very important and I find that people don't approach it properly in the literature. So I like to to talk about it. So to fully understand the distributional impacts of carbon tax, we need to distinguish between an indirect and an, a direct and an indirect effect. And also we have to distinguish between an expenditure channel and an income channel. So a lot of people don't do this at all. Mostly people look at the direct income channel effect and um, they forget the rest. So as I said before, most people look at this direct income effect the direct, oh, sorry, the direct expenditure effect. So what they look at is they say, okay, we have a carbon tax that increases the price of carbon goods, which affects households because they have to pay more for their consumption bundle. And poorer households tend to spend a larger share of the income on carbon goods than richer households. So it's regressive in affecting, um, affecting poorer households more. So this is generally the case in developing countries that it would affect poorer households more. And we find this channel or this direct expenditure impact to be regressive as well. But most of, I can't stress this enough, most of the literature looks at this and says, okay, carbon taxation is regressive, but there's so much more you need to look at. So the second is the indirect expenditure effect. So if the price of carbon goods goes up, that will affect firms' production costs. They will bring up the cost of the goods that they produce. So the non-carbon goods, prices will change, which also impact households. So there's no clear pattern about what the, if this is progressive or regressive in the literature. It's often looked at by using input output models and micro simulation models. We find this in Ireland to also be regressive. I think this very much just is depends on the country, whether it's regret, regressive or progressive. Then we have the income effects. So the income, household income is affected when carbon is taxed as well. Because what happens is, is that these firms are impacted by the changes in carbon prices and prices of other goods, which affects their demand for factors for their demand for labor and capital, which affect households. So capital income is generally found to be progressive because richer households have more capital. So if this is impact negatively, they will be impacted more than poorer households. And labor impact income can be found to be progressive or regressive in the literature we find it to be progress. So what you see is when you look at this income channel of labor and capital, richer households are impacted more. They have less income from capital and labor um, relative to poor households. So again, we see this initial regressive um, 
expenditure effect or the progressive income effect. Then the most important one is how the government reacts to this. So most of the literature assumes the government does not, doesn't change anything. It has the same share of its expenditure will be on transfers to household. However, if you look at what governments actually do, you see that they do increase their, for example, welfare benefits when prices increase. They increase it in line with the consumer price index. So we looked at Ireland and looked historically, you know, how this correlates with each other, the, the welfare transfers and the CPI, and obviously with the correlation. And we, we also looked at un, how unemployment benefits increase with unemployment. And when you introduce this and then assume the government reacts to the economic situation, you see that this is also very progressive. So what you find overall is, when you look at this whole overall impact, we find this to be progressive. Not many people do this because it's quite complicated. You need to have a dynamic model. You need to have a general equilibrium model that can look at secondary impacts. And you also have to have household heterogeneity regarding both income and expenditure. So it is hard to look at, but it's, it's I get really annoyed because so many people say that a carbon tax is regressive. However, they're not looking at the question properly. So that was my rant about regressivity. So in the literature, if you look at revenue recycling, um, you can see that when you use the carbon tax revenues for a specific purpose, you could reduce the negative economic impact, impact of carbon taxation, or you can decrease the inequality impacts of carbon taxation. So what you see in the literature is that the papers generally say, okay, what happens if we decrease this other tax with our carbon tax revenues? And they find that, okay, that's good for the economy. Or they say, oh, what happens if we transfer it to households? Oh, okay, that's good for the household's equity. But there are very few papers that, that look at this equity efficiency trade-off and look at both simultaneously. And there's also even fewer papers that look at, okay, what if we set, give half of our carbon tax revenue to reduce taxes and half of our carbon tax revenue to transfer to households? So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna look, we include all these distribution of channels. We include mixed revenue recycling where you can use a share of your carbon tax revenues for one purpose and a share for another purpose. And we go on a treasure hunt for dividends to see if we can find emission reduction, GDP growth and improved income distribution. So these are the scenarios we use. Um, basically we have a business as usual scenario, which just includes the world up to 2021. And then we have a carbon tax scenario, which includes this carbon tax trajectory up to 100 euro in 2050 that I showed before. And then we have our revenue recycling schemes. We have one that reduces the corporate tax, one that reduces the sales tax, one that reduces the wage tax. And then we have two which increases transfers to households. So basically you either use your carbon tax revenues to reduce these taxes or to directly transfer it to households. Then we have um, hybrid scenarios where we, we combine these two. I won't go through the list here, I'll show you in the graphs. So when we look at the first dividend, which is emission reductions, we see that okay, these are the different scenarios, the carbon tax, the revenue recycling to reduce taxes and the land transfer. We see that everywhere there's a reduction in emissions, right? There's a slightly higher reduction um, in the carbon tax scenario, because when you start revenue recycling, you boost the economy a bit, which dampens the emissions reduction. But overall, we see, okay, we have emissions reduction regardless of what we do with our carbon tax revenues. Um, there's always emission, emissions reduction. So the first dividend is always achieved. Then if we look at the second dividend, economic growth, this graph shows, um, compared to business as usual, what happens to real GDP? So we see that in the carbon tax scenario, there's a negative impact. So when we introduce a carbon tax, it's not good for the economy. When we start um, recycling revenues to reduce the corporate tax, sales tax, or wage tax, we see that the real GDP impact is positive. It's the highest in the corporate tax. So if we reduce the corporate tax, it's high, the highest economic boost, but in all of them, it's positive. However, when we look at transfers, there's still a negative impact. It's, it's less negative than the carbon tax because you're compensating households, which means they will continue to spend and boost the economy, but it's still negative. 
I won't go into the, the other macroeconomic results, but it is important to notice that the impacts on total employment aren't positive. So you do have a, a dampening impact on employment. It's not all roses, basically. So the second dividend is achieved in all of the tax reduction scenarios and the corporate tax is the highest. Now, if we look at the equity, this um, figure shows the impact on the real disposable income for different households. So the green bar is the average for all households. The red households are the rural households from the poorest to the richest. Um, so the dark red is the poorest, the light red is the richest. And the urban households are the blue households, where again, the dark blue is the poorest and the light blue is the richest. So what we see in the carbon tax scenario is, okay, households are all impacted negatively, but it is progressive. Poorer households are impacted less negatively than richer households, but everybody's worse off. Then if we start recycling revenue to cut, to reduce other taxes in the scenario, first in the corporate tax and sales tax scenario, we see kind of a weird pattern of where Poorer households are the worst off, but medium or well, middle income ones are, are the relatively best off. There's not a clear regressive pattern, but it is very regressive. Poorer households are still the worst off. However, in urban, um, no, I mean, sorry. Yeah. In urban households, um, we see a very different impact where richer households are. Definitely better off because it's a positive impact. So, what you see here is when you start using carbon tax revenues to reduce other taxes, you do get everybody basically has a higher real disposable income, but there is a, a clear higher positive impact for richer households. You can particularly see that in the wage scenario where poorer households are better off, but richer households are much better off. Um, then when you come to the transfer scenarios where we transfer these carbon tax revenues directly back to households, um, we see that the poorer households are much better off than the richer households, but the richer households are negatively impacted. So you can see this equity efficiency trade-off, right? If you, if you use reduction of tax, you get good economic benefits, everybody's better off, but the distribution is not great. And here you see the distribution is great, but people are worse off. So the question is, can we find a way of sharing these carbon tax revenues to, to, to both have equity improvements and efficiency improvements? So that's what we do by mixing these scenarios. So here we look at mixing um, the revenue used to transfer directly to households and the revenues used to reduce the wage tax. So on this side of the graph, all of the revenues are distributed to households through transfers. And on this side, it's all used to reduce the wage tax. And then in between, we mix it. So what we see is when we start with purely transfers, oh, and this graph shows if, if it's above the zero, that means that the economic growth has improved or that the equity has improved. And we distinguish between um, urban equality and rural equality. So in the case of pure only using transfers, we see that both for rural and urban households, the equity has improved. However, there is a negative impact on economic growth. And then as we transfer more towards wage tax reduction, we see that the economy improves, but the equity doesn't. So at this point, where we have 20% going to the wage tax and 80% going to transfer to households, we see that we have improved um, equality in rural areas, improved economic growth, but we have a negative impact on um, urban area, area equality. But could you have a way to find the, kind of the optimal distribution and just have to go for brute force? You just have to go, yeah, you have to go brute force, but it's easy. In the transfer one, the equity of both uh, rural and urban one, where lower one, the other one, how do you know it's fine? What do you mean? Uh, like uh, the blue ones, the yeah. 
uh, like the one that is on the transfer scenario, mm -hmm. which is the red one, uh, is higher than the other, uh, like the beige text scenario, right? Right now, in this video. Yeah. Uh, but in the previous slide, was it? Slide, like, uh, yeah, but this is, so this, this shows the equity. So it shows the, the ratio of the richest household divided by the poorest. I'd like to. Okay, okay, okay. So, so they got closer, although the uh, original they were off, but okay. they got closer to each other. Yeah. Uh, then, if we look at the corporate tax rate, we see similar things. Okay, here economic growth is bad. The more we reduce corporate tax, economic growth is better. And the opposite with um, with income distribution, we see that you know again at this twenty eighty split. There's a possibility to have awfully with the corporate tax. But the real winner is the sales tax. So in the case of the sales tax, we see that you know if we have complete transfers, um we, we won't get this economic gain. If we have complete sales tax, we won't get the the, the equality gain. But basically this whole area we can get all three. We can get both um improved income distribution and economic growth. And I didn't include emission reduction in these graphs because all of the scenarios achieve emission reduction. So we can find this, this triple dividend. So to conclude, uh, a carbon increase without other policy is pro progressive. So this is very contrary to what people generally say. And it's bad for the economy. Uh, revenue recycling to reduce wage taxes, corporate taxes, and sales taxes can result in a double dividend where we have economic growth and emissions reduction, but it increases quality, inequality. And transfers to households can reduce this inequality, but are bad for the economy. But if we mix both of these purposes, we can create this triple dividends um, in the case of sales tax reduction specifically. And more importantly, when you look at this, you can see that governments can use revenue recycling to trade off between efficiency and equity. And they can explicitly trade it off, which is very important. And what we also find is that basically the revenue recycling scheme is more important than the carbon tax level. So you saw the difference in results across the macroeconomic and distributional impacts. They completely depend on what you do with your carbon tax revenue, not so much on how much you tax carbon. So, let's leave it on there. Thank you very much. That was uh, it for me.